can be really, really creative, which is fantastic for some use cases. When we want to generate poems or a uh, card for our loved ones, they're a fantastic way of doing this. But sometimes we want our models to have different behaviors. And different could mean anything. Different could mean smarter. But in this case, sometimes we want our models to have structured behaviors. Sometimes our use cases require outputs in predictable formats. The kind of use cases I'm thinking of are things like tool use. Um, if I want my LLM to interact with internal APIs, it better be uh, a structured output. This is very useful for agents, which we're seeing increasingly more and more in the enterprise setting. For document processing and extraction tasks, you all want your model to output reliable formats. So the question I have is how can we enforce this structure? And uh, this kind of GIF is the kind of uh, precision that reflects the kind of precision that we need. We don't need 99% enforcement. We need 100% enforcement. Otherwise, it's going to break our pipelines. Today, I'm going to talk about four ways to enforce LLM output structure. And then I'm going to talk about what this tells us about the increasing importance of inference time for LLMs. So the four ways I'm going to talk about are begging for your life, or prompt engineering is the technical term, looping, which is when you get it do over and over again, fine tuning, and then finally, constrained generation. You can probably tell by the one that's last is that's going to be my favorite one, but I'll go through the others to humor you. So the begging for your life approach, uh, as an industry, we've decided to call this prompt engineering, but actually it's more like trying to convince a toddler to do what you've told it to do. And there's broadly kind of two ways I'll highlight that people go about prompt engineering. One way is few shot learning. So for example, I might get my model to behave in the way I want it to behave by showing it some examples of other good behaviors. This is kind of like um, when you're trying to convince a toddler what to do, you might give it some examples of how to do it. This works reasonably well and definitely shows an improvement in accuracy. My favorite prompt engineering method is actually when you threaten or <laughs> threaten it to do things. So uh, maybe you'll say, respond in valid JSON, otherwise a very cute kitten's going to get seriously hurt. Surprisingly, this actually works, which is somewhat concerning. Um, but this is not a great way to get models to do what we want them to do for two reasons. Firstly, it's not 100% guaranteed. Even when you convince a toddler to do something and maybe ask really nicely, it's still definitely not going to definitely do it. But more importantly, I don't think document processing applications should have threats of violence in them. It's probably not best practice. So this is probably not going to be the way that we're going to uh, enforce our LLM structure. OK, well, let's try looping. OK, this is another method that got a lot of popularity last year. Looping is essentially when you ask the model to try over and over and over and over again, like, OK, Try to output JSON. Oh, no, you've done it wrong. OK, try it again. OK, and again. And you keep doing that until it gets it right. And you hope eventually it gets it right, which it may or may not do. Not great. Not my preferred method. Well, it's additional latency. Every single time it goes through a loop, it has to do the whole generation again. Not ideal. And even then, it's still not guaranteed. So looping, even though popular last year, Probably not what we want to be going after. OK, so it's not begging for your life. We're not going to try over and over again. OK, what about fine tuning? This, got, you know, this gets a lot of hype. Fine tuning is something we're used to with previous generations of deep learning. And it actually works reasonably well. So this is a table from a company called Predibase who was trying to get models to output JSON. And it's got Llama 2 70 billion to go from about 57% correct JSON output to about 99.9%, which is pretty good. So you know maybe fine tuning can be reasonable. But also not a great method to go after. The reason why is it's kind of hard, expensive, and time consuming. In order to fine tune, I need to go and collect data that um, conforms to the structure that I want, which is going to take me effort. 
What if the structured schema that I want changes? What if the API I'm trying to call changes over time? Then I've got to do the whole fine-tuning process again, and really, life is too short for that. And even then, I'm not guaranteed to get 100%. So I'm still going to have my uh, pipelines break every once in a while. So we don't love this. We don't love begging for your life. We don't love looping. We don't love fine-tuning. So what if I told you that there was a way that we could enforce LLM behavior which had minimal latency overhead, had 100% certainty of working all of the time, and most importantly, happened at the inference runtime. So I can change it on the fly. And that's what constrained generation is. And when it comes to outputting structured formats, it's kind of the holy grail. I feel like we've kind of nailed it. We get 100% accuracy for the schema that we want, minimal latency increases, and all of this happens key at inference time. I know we have a lot of engineers in the room, so you're going to be asking, cool, this is great, how does it work? So to explain how constrained generation works, um, I'll first talk about how language models inference. Language models sample over all possible tokens. So for example, I might ask a language model a question like, what's your favorite color? And it can then sample from every single possible token or subword. So everything from an answer beginning with A to an answer beginning with green, which would make sense, and an answer beginning with the. And it has a probability, essentially, for every single possible token. Some tokens are going to be more likely. So if I'm asking about my favorite color, I hope that green is more likely than cat, for example. But this is how they sample. And they sample over these probability distributions. So with constrained generation, what we do is we filter out the ability of the model to sample from illegal tokens. So if I have, for example, a JSON format that I want to enforce, some tokens or some characters will be legal or illegal, depending on what time at the generation I'm at. The way this works is I essentially have my model can sample from this entire vocab. I then have a filter, which is the interesting bit, and I filter out those logits, which would break my schema, and then I can sample from those downstream. So what's interesting in structured generation is how we calculate this filter. Well, the filter needs to be really cheap because it needs to not slow down my inference too much. And I'm going to talk about how we build off our filters at Titan ML. And there are similar uh, techniques that others might use as well. So let's say I have a schema that I want to abide by. And maybe this schema allows me to talk about first names, last names, number of seasons in the NBA, and you know, years of birth, or something like that. When I'm starting, so character by character, I can start and I can look at what my allowed um, my allowed tokens are at every single point, or my allowed characters are. And when I'm starting, well, I better start with a curly brace. So that's, when I'm starting, the only thing that I'm allowed to do. OK, cool. Start with a curly brace. Now, the next thing that I can sample from can be anything from Y, L, N, or F, because those are the four things that I'm allowed to say. I can then say, OK, well, let's say I'm going to go down the F route. That means that if I'm selecting F, then the only characters that are allowed from there are F-I-R-S-T to spell first. That's the first name. So what we do is we do this at a character by character level, and then map this onto what the allowed tokens are. Because obviously, tokens can be subwords. They don't just have to be letters of the alphabet. So if I'm going down the root F, that means I'm allowed the tokens F. I can look, OK, what's next in my branch? Well, I'm not going to be allowed the tokens FA, because that's not going to spell first. But I will be allowed the token FI. And then I will be allowed the token FIR. And then I will be allowed the token FIRS, and so on and so on. And we do this tree um, for all of the possibilities. So this enforces our filter, which we can then apply onto the model. Um, and then means we get, with 100% certainty, the output will be generated uh, in that structure that we care about. So this is a really amazing method. And you might be asking, how can I use structure generation? Well, the 
probability is if you're using an API tool to access your models, let's say you're using OpenAI, the chances are they already have a JSON mode um, as part of their offering. Um, if you are using open source models, there's really fantastic libraries available, like Outlines, who's obviously based in Paris, LM Enforcer, which is um, kind of inspired by, by what we use. And also, any good self-hosting inference stack will also offer out the box. So we offer, for example, a JSON mode out the box. What this means is you should be able to put in a JSON schema, and the model should abide by that particular JSON schema. The result, ta-da, we have perfectly structured generation with really minimal latency overheads. Now, this is kind of cool, but I actually think this is just the beginning. So I think what we're seeing with structured generation is the first time of a really mature um, technique that we can use at inference time to control the model's behavior. But I don't think this is going to be the last, and I think we're starting to see this. So obviously, we have things with RAG, which obviously do things at inference time to make the model have more information. But also, with OpenAI's new O1, what we're doing is we're using the inference time to give the model more time to think. And as the, the longer it spends inferencing, the longer it spends thinking, the smarter its responses are getting. So there's loads of techniques that I think we're going to see over the next couple years that uses inference time rather than training time to make the model smarter. You could think, for example, in that filter stage, maybe I'm not filtering for a context-free grammar like JSON. Maybe instead I am having some kind of other filter or reward model, which is rewarding some kind of other behavior, which can change at inference time the way that the model behaves. So if inference is becoming more and more important, getting your inference stack right is really vital. So it's important that when you're building your inference stack, especially if you're self-hosting models, you're thinking about how you can build this inference stack in a way that allows you to do things like structured generation, how it can, for example, minimize your latency overheads so you can actually use the inference time to make the model uh, behave in the way you want it to. So if the question is, how do you get LLMs to output structured content? It's a pretty settled answer. You use structured output controllers, like the ones I've talked about today. But if the question is, how do you get LLMs to do what you want? Increasingly, the answer is, you probably want to do something at inference time to enforce the behaviors you care about. And we're really excited about this particular journey, and we think this is going to be a really big thing that's going to change over the next couple of years. Thank you so much for listening.